let's start with this. Well, Terry Harper very recently took to Twitter and posted a tweet that reads, First week of official fight camp is off to a good start. Hand is good, overall conditioning and fitness is good. Fight date confirmed and looking forward to adding the WBA title belt to my collection. 100% fully focused on this fight. Nothing else. And what the WBC's super featherweight champion is referencing is the upcoming unification match between herself and Kiyun Mi Choi. Everything's looking encouraging when it comes to that unification match, but not so encouraging when it comes to the unification match involving Michaela Mayer, the reigning WBO super featherweight champion, and Maiva Hamadouche. Oh. Michaela took to Instagram and left a comment that reads, June 19th, I was hoping to unify with IBF champ, but looks like Maiva Hamadouche is focused on qualifying for the Olympics instead. Yes, other countries are allowing their pro boxers to come back as amateurs and compete in the Olympics. New opponent in the works now. You know, I saw the post, I reacted to it, and Michaela, in so many words, communicated to me that, no, they're not going to be fighting. It interferes with her qualification dates, I guess, moving on to the next opponent. And, you know, you've just got to love the response time from the reigning IBF champion, Maeva Hamadouche, because she never takes any of these accusations lying down. She readily responded to this on Twitter by saying, it was three months. I agreed. I will be there for you. Don't worry. I already said that. So stop trying to avoid me with fake info. Go to train for me and shut your big mouth up. To which Michaela Mayer responded, your team said no. Talk to your team. This isn't the first we've heard of this. This isn't the first time that Michaela Mayer has taken to social media and in so many words stated that Maiva Hamadouche's Olympic run could interfere with their unification match based on what she's hearing on her end. And this isn't the first time that Maiva Hamadouche has denied those rumors, denied those accusations, and said she's ready to fight Michaela Mayer anytime, any place, anywhere. I have no reason to believe that Maiva Hamadouche is afraid, apprehensive about fighting Michaela Mayer. I have no reason to believe she's ducking. But there is a lot to reconcile here because this isn't the first time that Michaela Mayer has said this, and this isn't the first time that Maiva Hamadouche has denied it's it. It's not. There has to be a reason that Michaela Mayer is insistent that Maiva's Olympic run could interfere with her schedule for a unification match. Is Maiva out of the loop? I don't know. Is Maiva's team not communicating with her properly as far as what gets in the way of what? Is there something going on here that Maiva herself isn't aware of? Or, or, or you know, is Michaela the one that's out of the loop? Is she the one being fed misinformation? I really don't know, but this isn't the first that we've seen this. Oh. You know, a couple of weeks ago. This is what Michaela Mayer was talking about. And here it is again. This isn't encouraging. I mean, this confusion, this disconnect, this dissension, if you will, isn't what you want to hear because this isn't conducive towards getting the fight done. How could the two champions, the two combatants, the two participants in what is to be this contest have such very different takes as far as What's going on? There's no middle ground here. What's getting lost in translation? Maiva says Michaela's team is lying to her. If that's true, why would Michaela's team want to do that? Even for sure that's what's going on. You know, it could be that whatever deal is on the table right now is a deal that... Somebody doesn't like. You know, one of the fighters' managerial teams doesn't like. And, and maybe they're rejecting that deal without the fighters' knowledge. The thing is that the way that breaks down... Well, that could be either Michaela's team or Maiva's. It all depends on what the deal is. It could be due to the money. It could be due to the location. There are any number of obstacles and hurdles that might need to be overcome in order to bring this fight into fruition. But there's clearly a miscommunication here. There's clearly a disconnect. Because as far as both of these fighters are concerned, they say they both want the fight, but... They're not in agreement as to whether or not it'll happen. Papa versus Choi will happen before this does. We will likely get definitive and conclusive news as far as when to expect the unification match between Terry Harper and he and me Choi long before this fight materializes. Because if I'm being honest, I noticed what Michaela Mayer was saying over a week ago. I noticed that she was saying in so many words that Maiva's Olympic schedule could get in the way of their unification match, but I chose not to react to it right away. I wanted to allow the story to tell itself, and over a week later, nothing's changed. The tune is still the same. There's trouble in paradise. And I don't want to rush to judgment, start castigating anyone just yet, because it's not actually clear what's going on here. Who do you assign the blame to when both fighters have such very different takes on what's going on. All this confusion effectively communicates to me 
at minimum, what it tells me is that we're likely going to see Harper versus Choi before we see Maya versus Hamadouche. I think that's the real takeaway from all of this. In other news, just in reference to, you know, this week's big purse bid involving Teofimo Lopez, George Cambosos Jr., and Triller, who effectively outbid both Top Rank and Matchroom, Mark Riamondi tweeted, Triller's Ryan Kavanaugh tells me he sees Teofimo Lopez versus George Cambosos as probably a co-main event on a May card that would be paired with an influencer celebrity type. He went on to say, Triller would consider it like a double main event. We don't view them as an undercard, it's just a matter of... If we have a co-main event that brings a different audience than them or not. Kavanaugh said Triller will consider more purse bids where it's for a significant title with well-known talent and people that we think will attract the right audience. But he said Triller doesn't necessarily plan on signing free agent boxers in the future. That's essentially saying that Triller might be dipping its toe in the pool of the world of boxing, but it's in a rather novel way. It's a novel approach. They ain't balls deep. They're not staging 30 shows a year like Top Rank or, or global cards, global events regularly the way that Matchroom is. Yeah, Triller does host boxing matches of sorts, exhibitions and, and spectacles, but they're not knee deep in the business of boxing. Thus, neither Top Rank or Matchroom should view them as a competitor. They're different platforms. In so many words, that's what Bob Arum himself had to say about it. A rather anomalous element in reference to Triller winning the rights for this fight is the amount of money that they're willing to stake on it, $6 million, what I view as an overpayment for this fight. Oh, everybody was real quick to celebrate. But I don't think that people realize that this is yet another pay-per-view. This is going to be yet another fight that the boxing community at large has to pay to see. And this is not the caliber of fight that that warrants that kind of a platform. Essentially, you can be happy that Teofimo Lopez found a way to get more money than he would have got from top rank. You can be happy about that, but are you happy about the price tag? Are you happy that now you have to pay to see this thing? Main event, undercard or otherwise. You're gonna have to pay to see this fight. Are you happy about that? Any one of you guys out there got the party hats and confetti? You still feel like celebrating? Are you now beginning to understand why it is that Bob Arum was only willing to put up a certain amount of money for this fight? It's because guys like me and you don't want to pay to see Kimbosos versus Lopez. And even if I do? Because I do just so happen to profit from this sport greatly. Better still, even if I do, there's a good chance that many of you won't. Many of you likely won't pay for the fight. Many of you out there don't want to have to pay for that kind of fight. Undercard, main event, or otherwise. You and I both know it. You and I both know that this is the kind of fight you should be able to see free of charge on ESPN. And if Bob would have had it his way, that's what would have happened. Of course, this ain't a $6 million fight. You know, I'm often accused of repeating myself here on the channel. I'm often accused of repeating myself in my old age. And I think that the people accusing me of doing this don't realize that I'm doing that for a reason. I'm doing that because I know that many of you guys out there are fucking idiots. And it's not going to register the first time I tell you. This fight ain't worth $6 million. And if you think it is, you're essentially saying that this fight's value is in the same neighborhood as Wilder versus Fury 1. How much money was in the pot for that fight? How much did the guaranteed purses to both Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury come out to the first time those guys fought? You know how much? $7 million. Only a million dollars more than this fight. And if you think that this fight is actually worth the $6 million Trilla put up for it, you're putting this fight's value in the same neighborhood as Wilder versus Fury 1. I didn't realize that, did you? Deontay Wilder was guaranteed $4 million for the first fight with Tyson Fury, and Tyson Fury was guaranteed $3 million. That comes out to roughly $7 million in the pot. You think this fight's price is in the neighborhood of that fight? Well, if you do, ask yourself a question. If you were to put Teofimo Lopez versus George Cambosos Jr. on pay-per-view on a premium cable network here in America with a price point of $80, do you think that that fight would bring you back 325,000 pay-per-view buys the way that Wilder versus Fury did? Do you think it would do that well? Oh, you don't. You don't think it would do as well as Wilder versus Fury 1 did. Well, if that's what you're telling yourself, if that's what you're thinking to yourself right now as you listen to this video, you're proving me right. This is not a $6 million fight. You can say that Teofimo deserves more. You can say that 
he's technically the undisputed champion in the lightweight division, that he's paid the cost to be the boss, he's paid his dues, but at the end of the day, if you think that he should be paid more than what Bob Arum was willing to stake on the fight, well, the money's got to come from somewhere, and the way it breaks down, because Triller bought the rights for the fight, well, wait for it, that means the money's supposed to come from me and you. Triller might have staked six million dollars of their own money in order to be able to host this thing on their platform. Yeah, they might have done that, but in order for me and you to see it, we got to pony up the cash. We got to pay. So how many of you guys out there, how many of you bleeding hearts are buying this? Are going to pony up the $50 that it might cost just to watch this thing? How many of you? Oh, you're not going to buy the fight. You're not? Well, you do realize that that was Bob Arum's point all along. Oh. This is not a big marquee fight. And that's what I've been trying to tell you here on the channel. This fight's actual value may not even be anywhere near $6 million. And just because Triller was willing to put that up, just because they've got it to blow, that doesn't actually mean this fight would generate that kind of money. The saving grace, the silver lining here, is that this fight doesn't look like it's going to be the main event of whatever card it's being a part of, of, of whatever card you, you, you know, you're going to see it in. There are rumors and rumblings that this might be on the undercard of Mike Tyson versus Evander Holyfield 3. It's supposed to be an exhibition match between the two legends. Those two legends might do more in order to move the pay-per-view buys might. than this fight will, because this fight ain't worth six million dollars, hypothetically speaking. If this Kimbosos versus Lopez fight is a part of the Mike Tyson versus Vander Holyfield fight, then the pay-per-view might do relatively well, not because of Lopez versus Kimbosos, but because of Tyson versus Holyfield. Are you getting it yet? In that situation, it's Tyson versus Holyfield that would be the draw. It's Tyson versus Holyfield that would be the focus and the focal point, not Lopez versus Kimbosos Jr., because if you tried to stage Lopez versus Kimbosos Jr. as a pay-per-view, damn thing it'd likely flop. Nobody wants to pay $80 to see that fight. Hell, nobody wants to pay $50 to see that fight. They want to see that fight on regular old ESPN where it belongs. Now, this is the part where you call me a hater. This is the part where the kids that are wet behind the ears, the doodle butt generation, gets upset at some very inconvenient truths that are truths nonetheless, and presume to call me a hater for iterating those truths. But stop me when I tell a lie. This fight wasn't going to be a pay-per-view. It wasn't going to come at a cost to either me or you, but now it is. And since you're so in support of Teofimo Lopez's shrewd business move, are you going to be supporting his fight? Are you going to buy it? Or are you going to steal it? Are you going to stream it? Because depending on what your answer is, unless you're going to buy this fight, you're proving Bob Arum right. You're proving that this fight, this ain't no $6 million fight, and this ain't no pay-per-view worthy event. You don't pay for it. You just proved Uncle Bob right. And finally, I'm sure that most of you have heard by now, Gilberto Zerto Ramirez has signed a multi-fight deal with Golden Boy Promotions. Gilberto Zerto Ramirez, former super middleweight title holder and current light heavyweight contender, has signed a multi-fight deal with Golden Boy Promotions with his next fight to be announced soon. In order to get bigger fights, Ramirez was always going to have to agree to a deal with a major outfit. Matchroom, Premier Boxing Champions, Golden Boy seemed the logical fits. And Zerto says Golden Boy was the best fit. After several discussions, Golden Boy Promotions made the most sense and felt like the best partners for me, said Ramirez. They understood the goals and the agendas I have, and I have full faith in Oscar De La Hoya and the team to make the big fights happen. I look forward to working with them closely and to this new chapter of my career. Golden Boy Chairman and CEO De La Hoya is understandably happy to add another quality in Prime Fighter to the Golden Boy Promotions roster. Mexican boxing has been a worldwide force in this sport for as long as I can remember, said De La Hoya. Along with its legacy of courageous fighters, it possesses a fan base with a unique culture and energy that comes alive every single time its fighters step into the ring. That's why we are delighted to have signed Gilberto Ramirez to a multi-fight deal. An undefeated former world champion from the land of warriors, Mazatlan, Sinaloa, oh, Mexico. Oh, oh. We in the United States look forward to reopening to bigger and bigger audiences. We know that Ramirez will bring even more excitement to the stacked 175 pound division as he sets course for all of the world champions. Was this a good move for Zerto Ramirez? I dare say yes. I dare say yes because... The people over there at Golden Boy do happen to have their fingers on the pulse 
of the Chicano fans, the Chicano audience. That's what they had going on when Canelo Alvarez was over there with Golden Boy Promotions. He has since parted ways with Golden Boy, and we all know that. But that rapport that the people over there at Golden Boy Promotions have with the Chicano fans, that hasn't gone anywhere. That's not going to change. They helped make Canelo Alvarez who he is. They are currently still building Ryan Garcia, one of the biggest names in the lightweight division, in spite of not even being a world champion, not even being in possession of a world title. Yet this is one of the most recognizable fighters at 135 pounds. He's got a lot of Chicano fans. You ask me if Golden Boy Promotions is the right promotional outfit for a fighter of Mexican descent, a Mexican national, and I dare say yes, he's in the right place. Going to Golden Boy Promotions doesn't hinder his ability to fight top-ranked fighters or, 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 or matchroom fighters. Matchroom fighters least of all, as matchroom fighters and Golden Boy fighters fight on the same fucking platform. So that Dimitri Bivol fight is still accessible to him. What happens to his promotional outfit, though? Well, I really don't know, because... Seems like Golden Boy Promotions is going to be doing all the legwork. They're going to be the ones tossed with hosting Zerto Ramirez's fights and promoting those fights and, and trying to get him more exposure. I, I don't know that Zerto Ramirez's promotional company doesn't, you know, become subsidized or just phased out altogether. As, as he's not promoting himself, you understand. He's signed to a major promotional outfit that stages fights on a major platform. Thus, Zerto Promotions isn't actually doing any promoting. So, I mean, I, I don't know what happens with that situation, but what I will say is, you know, Golden Boy Promotions is actually the ideal place for a fighter like Zerto to reach an audience. And my initial reaction to this news, it was a good move and it was a smart move by Zerto Ramirez.